Some scientists are warning that climate change is making heat waves longer, hotter, more likely, and more dangerous. At the end of June, British Columbia experienced record-breaking temperatures climbing to over 45 degrees Celsius in certain areas. Earlier this month, BC's chief coroner announced 719 sudden and unexpected deaths over a seven-day period. She said that's three times more than what would normally occur in the province during the same period, and it's believed the extreme heat is to blame. This kind of weather might be a warning of what warmth is to come. So today we're asking, how can we better prepare for future heat waves and protect the most vulnerable? And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You can call now. Our number is 1-800-565-1940. Email marnoon at cbc.ca. And we're following Twitter at CBC Maritime Noon. The Intact Center on Climate Adaptation is a research center based at the University of Waterloo. Joanna Acom is the Managing Director of Climate Resilient Infrastructure. We reached her this afternoon in Montreal. Thank you for joining us, Joanna. Thank you very much. Boy, good to be with you. Well, it's great for you to have to have you with us here today. I, I, so many people looking at what happened in Lytton, BC, and just marveling at just how high the temperature rose in BC during those days. Do we know for sure that those kinds of heat waves are caused by climate change? I think the so overall temperature is we, we are warming and that's been documented that uh, Canada is, is warming about twice as fast as the global average. But on top of the general warming, we uh, basically uh, we foresee a, a, a increase in extremes, be that extreme heat waves, be that storms, flash flooding, um, so heat waves is just one of the extremes that is, that is on the rise um, and basically linked, yes, linked to climate change. Um, and basically the bad news is that we think it's hotter now, but it's going to get even hotter in the future and we need to prepare. And, and will it get hotter evenly across the country or are we looking at the higher temperatures being in the West and then other issues in the East? Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, generally the, the West, uh, it, it's more of an issue, but I think the, I mean, the heat warnings um, that were experienced in Halifax and, and like you know, Scotia, New Brunswick in the beginning of June demonstrate that extreme heat and heat waves uh, can also be a problem in the Maritimes as well. Um, so uh, normally, uh, well, different regions define heat waves in slightly different ways, but generally over about 30 degrees and the humidex of about 40 um, is a, and a kind of three days or more. So, um, yeah, it might not be necessarily as extreme as in the West, but I think it's something that we should be concerned about. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the danger dangers that come from climate change-induced heat. Uh, I mentioned off the top there that the, the number of deaths uh, jumped in British Columbia three times more than what normally would have happened in that seven-day period that I mentioned. So obviously this is a matter of life and death for some people. Uh, who, who is most vulnerable? Yeah, I think that uh, it's, a, it's a real climate kind of justice issue as well. I heard the, the previous segments talking about homelessness and obviously people who are already vulnerable are actually more vulnerable to the effects of extreme heat because they have less capacity to adapt themselves. Uh, so people who are living outdoors, such as homeless people, obviously um, may find it more difficult to shelter from the extreme heat. But similarly, elderly people, people with mobility issues or chronic illness, the very, very young children, uh, all these kind of vulnerable groups are more vulnerable to extreme heat. Okay, that's the, the, the extreme heat and the impact on and people's uh, health. What about the, the physical impacts? Uh, on our infrastructure. This is something that you look at, obviously, in yeah. your line of work. Yes, and I think the extreme heat, uh, obviously, the, the we have been looking at health impacts, because they're very obvious, the um, uh, impact on infrastructure such as railways, uh, power grids, um, also roads, kind of the history of roads melting, for example, at very extreme temperatures. Uh, basically, we, these infrastructure risks are also um, going to be probably more frequent in the future. And then I think the other the other thing we talk less about is impacts on um, kind of habitats and wildlife as well. Um, so extreme heat um, has numerous impacts, and I think also um, we talk about physical health, but extreme heat also um, impacts on mental health. Um, you know, people find it more difficult to sleep, um, 
and it can have a real impact on productivity also. I know in BC, uh, there was one scientist who was talking about just how even just clams and mussels who are attached to rocks uh, when the tide goes out and it comes back in, it's okay. But when the temperatures are so high uh, that he discovered, I think it was a, a gentleman, discovered that uh, a significant number of them had died as a result mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, and I think we think less maybe about, we, we assume that kind of nature is adapted, but um, the, the extreme conditions are also, you know, are significant for wildlife, as you say. Um, and I think um, a lot of marine mammals and birds, um, we're kind of seeing reports coming out of uh, BC now of the kind of the impact on wildlife also. Okay, so you mentioned railways and roadways. Uh, I also want to talk about homes and apartment buildings, those types of things as well. J just generally, though, how do you see us updating our, our built environment then? What has to happen? Sure. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of buildings, I think what keeps me up at night as well as extreme heat uh, when it's too hot is thinking about what happens in apartment buildings if the power goes out, for example, these cascade impacts, like if we have new power and the lifts are not working and people are essentially kind of trapped in the building, um, how do they, you know, how, how do you respond to that? So um, I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of dependence on air conditioning potentially, and uh, but also what, if the power goes out, is there any backup generation in, for example, old folks' homes uh, to keep the air cool so that people who cannot necessarily leave um, are not um, at risk? So I think that's one thing to think about. Um, but then generally, in terms of residential buildings, there's a lot of work going on um, in terms of how we better insulate our homes uh, and kind of make it so that we're less reliant on uh, electrical systems to heat and cool our homes uh, so we can use kind of air currents to, to cool the house, um, like a like a pass, the passive house, um, as it's called. So there's that, um, that work is kind of ongoing and is, um, I, I see that getting bigger. Uh, but there's also things people can do themselves as well. Um, for example, uh, buying heat resistant curtains, uh, getting kind of tinted uh, windows that actually reduce the, the, the heat coming through the windows because often glass and uh, fenestration is often a weakness when it comes to extreme heat. Um, and, you know, just it, making sure you're cooling your health in, in, the, in the evening as well um, by opening the windows when it is cooler. Uh, all these things add up, um, and, and also looking at uh, greening as well. Like for example, if you have a balcony, um, having some vegetation that shades your your house uh, can also help reduce the temperature inside. Mm. Well, we're talking about uh, heat waves and the climate change, and how to best uh, position yourself uh, so that you can uh, be prepared for this. And uh, we're talking with. Joanna Acom today. She's the Managing Director of Climate Resilient Infrastructure. That is at the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation, which is based at the University of Waterloo. Our number 1-800-565-1940 and her email is marnoon at cbc.ca. How can we better prepare for not just future heat waves, but uh, climate change in general and uh, especially protect the most vulnerable? We'd like to hear from you today. And the number again, 1-800-565-1940. You know, Joanne, as I, as I hear you talk here and think about how we need to plan, plan, I guess, for the future, does adapting mean defeat or is this a two-pronged approach here that you're talking about today? Yeah, I think that's very much so. Uh, I think there has been, uh, historically, we've, we've paid more attention to reducing greenhouse gases and particularly how people themselves in their daily choices can reduce uh, their impact on climate change. But um Really, we're beyond the point where we are not going to feel the impacts of climate change. So at the same time, we need to be adapting. And there's many things that people can do themselves to adapt. It's not just something that the government is responsible for. We all have a role to play. Um, so I think it's very much a two-pronged approach. And I see uh, we need to adapt faster, um, I think, is the key message. All right. Well, suppose you are planning new construction, then I'm wondering how up-to-date is the National Building Code when it comes to these projections that heat is going to be a continuing concern? Yeah, the National Building Code is currently being updated um, to take into account climate change and hasn't been 
so that hasn't been completed yet. Uh, but, um, in the meantime, there are uh, standards that the Standards Council of Canada and CSA Group have put out, for example, on um, flood resilient new communities, uh, prioritizing uh, flood resilience in existing communities is a standard that's coming out um, very shortly. And also there's a guide to reducing uh, basement flooding also. So we have standards even ahead of the building code being actually updated. There are certain standards that can help. Well, we'd like to hear from people maybe if they are planning on a build or are making some renovations and, and accommodating for climate change and, and also what they're doing if they're just a current homeowner and, and trying to uh, modify their lives at home. Uh, maybe also as well talk a little bit about where you'd like to see investments. We just heard Joanna mention that it's uh, not just government, private uh, sectors as well will we'll have to play a role here. So 1-800-565-1940 is the number. What about that, Joanna, then? What investments, you know, from the private and the public sectors would you like to see? Um, I think there's been a lot of talk about um, nature-based solutions uh, or kind of how we can use nature better to make ourselves more resilient to climate change to reduce greenhouse gases by increasing carbon storage and sequestration, but also combat the uh, loss of biodiversity. So I think a really a uh, more focus on investing in these solutions would actually, like for extreme heat, a lot of cities are now working on increasing their urban tree canopy and kind of cooling corridors along rivers, for example, in combination with um, to combat extreme heat. But similar measures like uh, reforestation and the upper catchment can also help reduce flooding downstream, for example. So really thinking in a system approach about how we can use nature to help ourselves. Mm. That's another way this divides in some ways, isn't it? Urban versus rural. And there's a term, urban heat islands. What does that yeah. mean? So basically that means, um, in, in, and I, I just actually experienced it. I went camping at the weekend and it was, it was shocking actually coming home just how much more hot it was in Montreal compared to uh, when I was camping in, in my jumper. Uh, so overnight, uh, typically it would cool down. Uh, but in the, uh, in the urban setting, our artificial surfaces absorb the heat during the day and then they emit, they continue emitting that heat during, overnight. So actually the, the air doesn't cool down. Um, so we get these extended uh, hot temperatures and, and quite difficult to re refresh the house, for example. Uh, and it can be actually uh, kind of 12 degrees hotter in the city than it is in the rural areas uh, due to this effect. That said, uh, climate change and heat waves also have an impact on rural communities, don't they? Oh, yes, exactly. I mean, uh, climate change has an impact on all sectors. I mean, agriculture is also a sector that is impacted by climate change because it it's a result in different temperatures and different amounts of water, um, which obviously affect uh, cropping. And so each sector is impacted by climate change in its own way. Um, so it's not that it's not just an urban problem, but uh, for extreme heat, it is specifically a key issue in, in cities and towns because of the urban heat island effect that you mentioned. Mm. Well, we're uh, asking about climate change and heat waves and uh, how we better adapt uh, for perhaps what is down the road. And uh, we'd like to hear from you. 1-800-565-1940 is the best way to get in touch, but we're also taking emails at martin at cbc.ca. We're going to jump to the phone lines first, though. Dave Stewart is calling from Dartmouth. Hi, Dave. Hi, how are you? Good. What are your thoughts on adapting? The climate change. The uh, horse has left the barn. You know, when we're getting record-breaking uh, temperatures now, which we we're not supposed to expect another 20 years from now, mm -hmm. it just means that we have to rethink everything. We should basically be rethinking everything in what is our carbon footprint, how do we get the net zero carbon in everything we do, and municipalities and governments have a very very powerful tool to do that, and it's called the building permit process. If you don't meet a certain energy standard or a certain minimum carbon footprint, you don't get your permit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I mean, how far does that go to, uh, as you say, uh, deal with the situation, which is that the horse has left the barn? Well, one of the things we're going to have to start thinking about, and we thought we thought this would never happen here in Nova Scotia. We're now starting to talk about that all public buildings should have at least part of air condition. We never thought about that before. But air now, mm -hmm. when, yeah, air conditioning, because when you get 
720 people dying in BC because of overheating. They never expected that either. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, all new buildings should be air conditioned. All the build new buildings should not have fossil fuel anywhere. And basically, uh, you know, this is for our children and our grandchildren. Well, well, Joanna, you touched on air conditioning there. I mean, would you go so far as to say all new builds should have some form of air cooling system? Um, I think uh, that would probably be a question for the architects. But um, uh, I think, that, you know, there's a lot of work to try and get to a point where we can use a uh, more natural process as well to cool our buildings, like um, using green walls and kind of natural air circulation from air from, like, uh, the basement. For example, but um, you know, air conditioning is something we are reliant on at the moment, and I think how we power that air conditioning is also, um, you know, we need to think about that also because you know we had 720 people, I think it was 777 actually, but um, die in BC, and uh, but you know it could have been worse if the power had gone out, um, and power grid is something that you know it's, it's possibly a risk that um, the power goes down. So I think we also need to think how, how reliant we are on electricity as well. Mm -hmm. Dave, I'm just wondering before I let you go, uh, you know, we also talked about the, the, the individual attempt here to try to make changes. What, what are you making as far as changes in your own life, would you say? Well, I bought an energy efficient car about uh, five years ago, and I'm, gonna, I'm saving basically to flip to that to a, an electric vehicle right now. I'm running a diesel, but I don't use it that often. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the diesel has been fixed, it's been cleaned up. It was a Volkswagen, and of course, they got uh, caught in their own little diesel gate. But, uh, you know, energy efficiency, I think, in everything that we do. And I think there should be the uh, emphasis on site based renewables for every new building or, or development. I mean, whereas. Uh, they made all these announcements about solar gardens. That's a great first step. But, you know, at the same time, we have to look at the whole issue of, of uh, affordable housing as well and how we tie those two together. Because if you can afford to live in that, that means you can afford to heat it and cool it. So it's not just about, uh, it's not just about uh, the initial capital cost. It's about the operating cost and the life cycle assessment of the carbon footprint produced by everything that we do. All right. Well, those are really interesting points, Dave, and maybe we'll delve into more of them as we go along here in the next half hour. But thanks for joining us today. We take, appreciate your call. Oh, you're welcome. All right. That's Dave Stewart in Dartmouth. We're talking about preparing for extreme heat and other weather events caused by climate change. We'd love to hear from you today. 1-800-565-1940 is our number, and our email is marnoon at cbc.ca. We're going to get to more of your thoughts in just a moment. First, though, Sandy Smith has a look at Blaze News Headlines. Hey, Sandy. Hi, Bob. The federal and Nova Scotia governments have announced a daycare agreement they say will lead to $10 a day child care five years from now. The person planning to develop Fredericton Centennial Building in the city's downtown will not try to include a hotel in his plans, as had been the case. We'll hear from him when we use the next one. And the PEI government has renewed a program to help people get into the lobster fishery. Details of these stories and others in half an hour, Bob. Thank you, Sandy. 1-800-565-1940. My guest today is Joanna Acom with the Intact Centre on Climate Adaptation. And let's head back to the phone. Sandy Thorne is calling from Truro. Hi, Sandy. Hi, how are you doing? Good. What are your thoughts on adapting so that we prepare for climate change? I think there's all kinds of stuff that we can do, but one of the most uh, impactful things we can do is related to the single largest purchase that most people have in their life, which is their house. Mm -hmm. um, and if people change the way that we build our homes, then we can have a significant impact on the environment. I'm a certified net zero builder, and I built my first house last year. Uh, it was passive, net, certified net zero ready. Um, and that house was uh, sold last year, and that house is right to zero right now. Um, it's got a 5,600 kilowatt hour system on it. So that home right now has a zero footprint on the grid. And I'm in the process of building a second one now, which will certify net zero ready again. So by building homes this way, we can significantly reduce our impact on the environment and our draw on, uh, you know, utilities. 
Okay, and so you've had uh, at least some success in building these houses. How how attractive are they to purchasers? I mean, are, are there challenges that people present to you and say, mm, I don't know, if, I don't know if that's going to work for me. There's been lots of changes in the technology certainly over the last little while. It's an uphill battle, and we're in the early days of it. And one of the biggest problems is lack of education and understanding on. Uh, the part of home buyers, uh, the part of financial institutions, insurance companies, and, and home appraisers, and everything. So we're getting into an area that's new to home construction in our region, and we're always a bit uh, slow to catch up with other provinces like Ontario or BC. Where I, I mean, compare we have three certified homes in the province here. I'm one of the only persons to build one in the last couple of years. And if you go to Ontario, they're probably building 400 a year uh, up there. So. It's the way forward, and it's the way that the National Building Code is probably going to end up going towards is to a net zero home. But right now in this market, it's very restrictive and a highly customized home. So it's, it's a smaller market, which means the profit margins aren't there. So it's very difficult to get financing. For example, the first one I had to finance myself personally, and I'm doing the same thing again with this one. Mm, okay, yeah, I was wondering about the front-end costs of a net zero energy home and how, how that compares to a regular build. Well, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around like passive, net zero ready, and net zero. So passive host is a standard uh, that is a very high standard of home, uh, but passive certified is another standard. Um, so the homes that I build are passive in principle. So we take a lot of the build methods from passive principles and design, but we don't go for the full certification. So that last 15% that's required to get the certification is extremely uh, cost, uh, you know, laborious. So. We do pass the principles where we get most of the benefits, and then we uh, certify the homes net zero ready or net zero. So with the net zero aspect, if it has enough solar on the house to zero it out, uh, then you can certify it as net zero. If the home is energy efficient enough that the load is low enough that if you put solar on the roof, but don't put the solar on the roof, you can have it certified as uh, net zero ready. And the costs right now, uh, depending on where you want to go or anywhere is from 20 to 50 percent more premium on a standard home but i think what a lot of people don't understand but we're starting to see people learn and they're quite kind of demanding this in their homes is that the homes that are being built now are built to the minimum building code standard so the homes that are being sold now for you know three four hundred thousand dollars these homes are built to the minimum legal allowable standard and and that's the homes that people purchase and live in for 25, 30 years with their family and end up taking on a 25 year mortgage for. Her. I mean, so as people become educated and they see if I spend a bit more, I can have a home that's healthier for my family. It has very little impact on the environment and stuff. They're willing to pay a little bit more for it. So, but it, it is, it's an uphill battle for sure. All right, so Joanna, lots of variations on, uh, on a more environmentally friendly home as Sandy had laid out there, but, uh, but uh, you know, he mentioned uh, concerns around financing, even just to get the thing built, uh, and then the front end costs, 20 to 50% premium compared to a typically purchased home. What are your thoughts on just, just the cost of getting there? Yeah, I think obviously um, there is a cost. Sometimes actually it costs as much to build something right as it costs to build something wrong in some some respects. And I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of focus on building a net zero home, but what about resilient homes? You know, we want our homes to also be ex resilient to the extremes that we're expecting. So um, there's kind of a lot of guidance about how to um, how to make them resilient to flooding, how to make them more resilient to extreme heat. Uh, and we need to think about that as well as lowering greenhouse gases. Um, so, um, and how, how we can incorporate also um, natural infrastructure in our development, I think is another uh, key area. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to reduce our greenhouse gases, but we also need to be resilient to the extremes that we predict will occur in the future. I know yesterday in the show, Joanna, we were talking actually about cars, uh, but we got into a bit of a discussion about electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles specifically and rebates that are available for the, those purchases. Uh, how are we doing when it comes to houses? So the, the federal government has a, the ENA guide, which has the subsidies that people can access for increasing energy efficiency through kind of things like replacing their, their windows and kind of, you know, insulation, that kind of thing. Uh, and what I would encourage is that um, there's also a, a, um, a resilience aspect of that, which is, uh, but it's, it's kind of lesser and there's less focus on that. So I really um, would like to see basically 
more um, more incentives for people to make their, their own homes more resilient to, to flooding, to extreme heat, uh, because really, you know, the government cannot do everything, and if people are more uh, conscious of the risks as well, and they have uh, someone to help them do it, then, um, you know, they, they can take action themselves. Okay, Sam, do you have a final thought before we move along? No, just uh, I agree with what she's saying because, uh, I mean, the next evolution of this is going to be carbon embodiment because we can build these energy-efficient homes, but one of the other benefits uh, building homes that she's talking about is the embodied carbon in them. So it's not just about building a home that's energy-efficient and doesn't pull on the grid. I mean, you can build a net-zero home or a passive host, but the embodied carbon that has been used in all the materials for that host might never be zeroed out. So that's absolutely another aspect of uh, moving forward with building homes and whatnot and stuff. And the rebates with the government, yes, they could absolutely do so much more uh, than what they're doing right now because I don't want to say it, but for the most part, anytime people talk about, you know, environmentalism and climate change, the honest truth is it's all lip service. And the sad reality of all of it is it's pioneers that are doing these things on their own. And until there's profit, uh, in saving the environment, you're never going to get large industry on board with it. Mm. Okay, bit of a somber note to end that on there, Sandy, but yeah, we really appreciate your thoughts on this. Thanks for calling today. Thanks, you guys have a great day. Yeah, you too. We're talking about climate change and extreme heat and other weather events caused by climate change and how we can best adapt for what we're told is ahead for us uh, in our construction and just our lives in, in general. And we're happy to hear from our listeners today. 1-800-565-1940 is the number. We're also taking emails at marnoon at cbc.ca. Let's head over to Surrey on PEI. Ginny McMillan calling. Hi, Ginny. Ginny, you're cracking up a little bit there. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, on a bit of a scratchy line, but go ahead. What are your thoughts? Okay, okay. Um, when I see acres and acres of cut glass, as if it was a window or target, I'm thinking <laughs> if there was more uh, bushes or, you know, uh, rock gardens or anything like that, uh, first of all, it would create more shade for the birds and for other, you know, for other animals. Because what I see uh, uh, around the world, when people, people start cutting trees, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's much harder. The air is more hot, so you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm sure the people who build those nice lawn rollers you can sit on, like build tractors, they would they were hate me for that. <laughs> but when you think that the making of those machines, and they come to you some sort of fuel, and, you know, people don't think that they could do something individual, that only big companies are responsible for climate change. But... Like I said, I, I'm a painter. Maybe I know this more. I don't know. But I see acres and acres of cut grass. And for me, I think it's a big mistake. And I wish people, like, in, uh, there, are build, there are building houses everywhere in the country where I live. And every time I thought, oh, I hope we put some bushes there or, you know, something. Mm-hmm. But all do the exact same pattern. It looks like an indoor carpet. Okay. <laughs> well, well, did... It's funny, but it, it, it's not a good way to uh, deal with the environment and with the water warming up and so on. Okay. Well, Ginny, thanks for those thoughts. Uh, your mind really is crackling quite a little bit there, so I'm, I'm going to let you go and bring Joanna back in. Yeah, she's saying uh, building houses, Joanna, um, and then and cutting down things around that house and not replacing it on, on a large scale when you start to look at construction across the countryside. Yeah, and I think this highlights uh, what I was talking about by kind of working with nature and natural processes and trying to restore some of what we've lost also. Um, and I think that the thing as, as well as, as working with nature and having nature as part of our cities and our towns is that um, basically we can we can work on win-win situations. So we can, uh, if we work on our afforestation, for example, or planting trees or kind of uh, restoring our rivers, reconnecting our weapons, we can actually come up with actions that increase biodiversity, reduce greenhouse gases by increasing carbon sequestration and increase climate resilience at the same time. So these win-win-win approaches, uh, I think, are key 
need to kind of tackling these these three elements that we're we're, we're working on. All right, Jenny, great to get your thoughts. Thanks again. I'm, I'm sorry about that crappy phone line, but we're going to move along and, and head to the Halifax area. Tom McLean is calling. Hi, Tom. Hi. Hi. What are your thoughts on adapting to climate change? Well, it's a tough one, but the biggest thing we have to do, and I've, I'm a professional engineer, I've been following it for, and doing it for 40 years. The biggest single thing we have to do, the biggest impact, isn't the light bulbs or the cars. I mean, those are all important, but have fewer kits. Every consumer adds to the load we put on the planet. And uh, it, it, it's a tough one. It's going to be multi generational fix. And, you know, I know I realize we're running out of time, but we have to do that. Fewer kids. Population growth. Aren't, aren't we already having fewer? Aren't we already having fewer kids, though? I mean, I don't know. Uh, so I, I don't know what to, I don't know about that. But Joanna, what about that? Fewer kids. Yeah, it's uh, really some like the carrying capacity of the planet. And uh, if you listen to David Attenborough, uh, that's kind of uh, one of his kind of key arguments as well. It's like the you know that's just there's too many people globally on the planet. Um, but I think you know the balance of uh, where people are having more kids is generally in more developing countries, whereas in the developed world we're having probably less kids. Um, so it's kind of a, a balance in issues of equity and uh, things like that, which are kind of uh, quite complex to solve. I think the, the sustainable development goals, I guess, are one way we're trying to work towards that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a tough, uh, tough issue to solve. Yeah, because Tom, you yeah, try, yeah, yeah. try to build a population to build the economy, right, Tom? So that's the that's the rub. The pl the flip side of that is every consumer in the developed world, North America, Europe, Japan, and all, consumes 10 times the resources, say, of someone in, uh, say, Bangladesh. So two there, or 10 there, is equal to one here as far as consuming. It's not the number of people, it's the amount of consumption per person. And we are spoiled, spoiled, spoiled in the developed world. It's a tough one. Yeah, and uh, you know, we have to be. We might have to be satisfied here with one person or you know, one one offspring per, not the zero population growth, of two point one. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it is the economy does grow. I mean, cars wear out. You change your iPhone every five years or whatever it is. It won't be the same. It won't be the same trajectory, but it it'll be a more sustainable trajectory. Yes, the economy, the economy, every time we get up, we need our basics of food, clothing, shelter, and fun. Someone's going to provide that, and that'll keep the economy going, but uh, we can't go at this rate. Mm. It's like it's like running down your bank account. Mm. We can't. Okay, and, and Joanna, managing our consumption uh, includes even the size of the home we're building, I guess. Yeah, and I think um, the, the interesting thing I see at the moment as well is a, kind of a reevaluation of what is the economy. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether listeners have read the Desk Upster Review from the UK, for example, or the World Economic Forum, New Nature Economy. But there's a, a rethinking about how, uh, what is the economy? An economy is actually based on produce, like the produced economy, which we focus a lot of our attention on, but it's also the, the human capital and the natural capital as well. So nature is not external to the economy. It is part of the economy. And I think we're, we're coming to kind of reevaluate well, what is actually what is actually worth our dollars, um, and putting more putting a value on natural capital and human capital as well. Retired retired after forty five years of teaching at the agricultural college in Truro, and then with Dalhousie, and I've had the opportunity um, both the financial resources, but also the opportunity to travel to many many different parts of the world, and of course having an inquiring mind, looking at things all the time. Uh, uh, first point, uh, one of the, the partners uh, that I was in, involved in an international uh, 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 dual degree program is a university in the Netherlands. It's Aries University. Uh, uh, Fifteen years ago, they built the tallest greenhouse in, uh, in, in uh, Europe, and that is their main teaching and administration building. It is a greenhouse with uh, the structure inside, so you, you're basically using the airspace, it's, it, and it's a zero-carbon footprint building. Um, and uh, they 
tiles on the roof. Things are controlled in terms of curtaining for uh, cooling. They collect, have water tanks. That's where they get their heat, their water, and so on. A very, very interesting, interesting building. And of course, the, the building inside is a, is a normal structure, but you don't have the cost of insulation because the airspace between the building and the greenhouse effect itself acts as as the insulator. Um, so that that's one thing. Um, another thing in, in my reading, my understanding in uh, California now, all new housing must have uh, solar panels installed unless they're, you're in a wooded area and um, and it would require that the, the trees be cut. Uh, I, I think that's interesting. That's a, a, a gentleman earlier had talked about uh, mandating those things in, in building codes. Third thing, um, we, we have this big push to put solar panels onto homes. Um, and municipalities have all sorts of land which is part of watershed areas that uh, you can't build on. And so, yes, that, that provides uh, wildlife reserves and so on. But you could also build a, a solar farm uh, and or a wind farm. I've seen these things in Scotland and in Europe and Netherlands as well. Uh, and individuals in turn could um, could contract with the municipality to say, I will buy X number of kilowatt hours per year for five years or 10 years, whatever. And then that, that becomes sort of a covenant that goes along with the house, if the house gets sold. Mm -hmm. So you, you're, you're committed to that. And you, you have the advantage there of uh, locating the solar panels uh, for the greatest uh, uh, bang for the buck in terms of, 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 of generation, um, you can use um, solar panels which will take the bounce on the on the backside, which you don't get if you put it on your own roof unless they're on an angle or that you're creating your own little solar farm off. And the, one of the biggest costs of putting a solar system in, because of, we had looked at this in our own home, was is really the cost of the inverters. Um, as opposed to the panels themselves. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's that. And then the other thing that bothers me when I hear about this whole push for uh, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and so on, to do that, you have to build a whole new infrastructure for charging. And, yes, that's happening. The, the, the Biden administration in the U.S. talking about that as a commitment. We're doing that. You can drive from Nova Scotia to B.C. now. Uh, with an electrical vehicle, what, what's happened to the, uh, why isn't there an equivalent push for hydrogen in that regard? Uh, hydrogen can, can continue to use existing infrastructure with gas stations. Hydrogen is actually a safer fuel than gasoline. Okay. Um, you, uh, you can have refineries for hydrogen production, use your tankers to move the hydrogen to, uh, to the gas stations. And there's, a, there's a, 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 an advantage as well that you can install a hydrogen generator at an individual station if, by chance, you don't get the delivery. Hmm. So those are my thoughts. Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? You don't sound grumpy at all, John. And what, what, a, uh, what a great number of unique approaches there you've just laid out for us. So thank you for that call. Yes, you're welcome, sir. You take care and enjoy your show. Oh, thanks thank very you. much. Joanne, I don't know where to start there. I mean, what, what, well, first of all, what about the push for hydrogen? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think I've, I'm, I've covered, um, the Intech Center actually, we're focused on climate adaptation. So I, um, I'm very, I'm not so much the expert in, uh, in reduction of greenhouse gases, but, um, I completely agree with that it's important and, you know, hydrogen is a rapidly developing thing. I see it kind of all over the world, uh, in the UK, uh, hydrogen being developed. Um, so I see that as one of the approaches that we would use. But I, I think my concern in all this is that we don't lose fact of the, the fact that even if we do these measures, um, and even if we have electric vehicles, we, we still have to, we still have to prepare for the extreme events that are coming because we haven't taken action quick enough. Um, so when I hear about, um, you know, kind of the, the net zero houses, I, 
agree it's important, but I still kind of, I'm always asking the question, but how, how are the buildings and the infrastructure adapted to the extremes we already know that are coming, and can we move quicker on that front? Well, I'm just wondering, and we'll, we'll end it on this point, I guess. Uh, I still have that image that John uh, laid out for us there in Netherlands, that teaching and administration center he was talking about at the university. Wow, what a, what a unique approach that is. is it, would that be something in line that you're, you're thinking we should be looking more at? Just be very uh, on, on, was it, uh, on the vanguard of, of that kind of construction. Yeah, I think I think the Netherlands, where we have a lot to learn from the Netherlands, they're a very innovative uh, country. Um, a lot of uh, interesting work on flood management, for example, because um, they're so much uh, you know uh, sea level below. Um, so we see actually a lot of uh, Dutch examples of really making space for rivers and renaturalizing a river so that there is room to flood, so that we're not putting my buildings on the floodplain, we're actually retreating from the floodplain. Um, so I think there's a lot we can learn from the, the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I think, you know, being older and acting more quickly on this issue is really, uh, really what we need to be doing because uh, we're making progress, but it's just not quick enough. Wow, an interesting discussion indeed. Thank you to everybody who called today with their thoughts on this. And Joanna, thanks for your time as well. Uh, we appreciate this very much. It's a pleasure. It's interesting to hear your uh, comments on that. And I, I would like uh, people to think about resilience in their everyday as well as reducing greenhouse gases. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. Joanna Aikam is the Managing Director of Climate Resilience Infrastructure at the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. That's at the University of Waterloo. Well, you can still have your say if you'd like to, to add some thoughts to today's program. Leave a message at 1-800-565-5463 or you can send us an email at marnoon at cbc.ca.